I have a confession to make, and it's something I'm not proud of. I have never played the Generation 5 Pokemon games. I know, I know, blasphemy. Today, however, I repent of my past sins and will attempt to beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Black using only Dark Pokemon. I don't know much about Pokemon locations or encounters in this game, so it's sure to be a fun ride. Comment below on what you think will be the hardest part of this run, though you may be surprised. As always, my name is Boy because why not? Professor Juniper then introduces me to my best friends, which is normally the reverse of how it goes. Shouldn't I introduce her to my best friends? But whatever. When one of my apparent friends finally arrives, we're able to pick our starters. And I go first, because it's my house, my rules. I choose Snivy so that Sharon will have the very iconic firefighting Pokemon, Blaziken. Actually the other one, Infernape. Actually the other one still, Embor. There's way too many of those things. At this point, my friends want to have a poke battle, but I'm afraid they're gonna wreck my room, which they do twice. Then my so-called friends leave me to clean up on my own. I'm getting pretty angry here. I try to follow Bianca to her house to give her a piece of my mind, but I see that her dad is already doing that. Let's be honest here though, they're trying to portray him as a bad guy for not wanting his daughter to explore the world with dangerous monsters, but to me, he seems like the most responsible parent in the Poké universe. We meet with the professor, who gives us a Pokédex and a town map, and challenges us to catch Pokémon. I choose not to enslave helpless little creatures, thank you very much, and am promptly made fun of for not catching any. At this point, my anger leads to hate, and I join the dark side. It's time to teach these guys a lesson with dark Pokémon. In Accumula Town, there's a gathering of Team Plasma guys pointing out the very real concerns of capturing Pokémon. Unlike most Pokébaddies, these guys may actually have a point. When I get to Route 2, my mom calls, and even though I can see her face because it's a video chat, she still introduces herself to me. Okay, she gives me some shoes, and I can finally find the first dark Pokemon of the run, a Perleon. Even though she's a girl, I name her Vader just to make sure we all understand the theme here. Bianca ambushes me before the next town, and honestly it's a pretty close fight. There isn't much I can do here besides tackle, and Vader does get pretty low, but I do end up winning. The fight against Sharon goes a lot smoother, so I don't need to show it. I get to the first gym, and can I just say how lame it is that they decide who you fight so that your starter will always be at a disadvantage? That seems a bit like cheating to me. I get to fight Chili, who starts with a Lillipup. After three turns of me using Scratch and him using Workup, Lillipup is healed and then responds with a Bite. Even with the boost though, it doesn't do that much. I do have a plus defense nature, so that's not bad. After taking out the little pup, Vader levels up and learns Pursuit, just in time for the Pansier. He also uses Workup, which would have been concerning if he had ever used an attacking move. But three Pursuits take him out, giving me the first badge in the back. In the Dream Yard, I see my idols, Team Plasma, beating up on a helpless fetus. Okay, they're obviously bad guys, I get it now. Can't we at least see some gray area here? After beating up some Team Plasma grunts, with a little bit of help from Sharon, I get to Nusreen City. Before I can enter the gym, however, N pops out and wants to fight. All right, this is going to be a bit rough, however. p Dove goes down to a single pursuit because it was a crit, and out comes the Timber, who is really scary. I hit him with Torment, so he can't just keep low kicking me to death, and then I throw some sand in his face, which actually makes him miss a low kick. Nice. A couple more sand attacks, and Vader starts scratching. She avoids another low kick, and the timber goes down without actually doing any damage. That was incredibly lucky, to be honest. The Timpole comes out next, and goes down to a few pursuits. Then N starts telling me about some legendary Pokemon or something. Who cares? Turns out the gym is actually a museum, where they do all their shady gym stuff in the back. I don't care about these dead Pokemon, man. Show me the live ones. Before facing the gym leader, I go towards the Pinwheel Forest where this girl gives me Rock Smash, a fighting move that would be very helpful for the gym if Perleon could actually learn it. But alas, it was not meant to be. I find a button underneath a book that reveals a secret passage, like some magic medieval castle. But what if someone were standing to the right of the bookcase when this thing opened? They'd get squashed. I find Lenora hiding under the bookcase, like a troll under a bridge, and decide to beat her up. Her Hurtier intimidates me, which is already not great, and I try to get lucky with a Sand Attack. I do manage a critical hit pursuit that still doesn't kill him, and I'm already leered twice, so now I've got no defense. I hit two normal pursuits, 
and then go down to a single takedown. Yikes. So I lost, just like that. Now even though the run is officially over, I do decide to fight Lenora a few more times, see if I can come up with a better strategy for the next run. The problem is, that doesn't work. I do get incredibly lucky and manage to beat Herdier a single time without taking any damage, but my defenses were dropped a ton, and after a single weak pursuit, Watchdog takes me out. I try every strategy I can think of here, with Pursuit, Sand Attack, Torment, hoping for crits, which is not a good strategy, I know, but I don't even manage to get past the Herdier in any more attempts. Oh boy. I knew this was going to be rough with only a single Pokemon for the first two gyms, but man, this is tough. I decide that for run two, I'm going to EV train like a lunatic and see if that can push me over the edge, though I'm not that hopeful, to be honest. So I start the game over again, and since this is officially the second time I've played this game, I'm much more experienced now. That means things will go a lot smoother. I blow through the first stuff and catch another female Perleon, who I named Ventress this time, because Vader is not a girl, that voice is way too deep, but before I can even get to the first gym, Bianca's Lillipup kills Ventress. Okay, maybe I'm not that much more experienced. So I start over once again and wreck my room for a third time. This time, I get a boy Perleon who I name Vader. Vader gets payback against Bianca's Lillipup, beats the first gym easily enough, and manages to beat N, though barely, and before I know it, I'm back in front of Lenora one more time. Now, with an EV trained Vader, who still dies against the Herdier. Just like last time, the run is over, but I try a few different strategies and actually do manage to beat the Herdier again, only to immediately die to Watchdog. After a few more tries, I'm getting pretty close to saying that this run seems impossible. Considering that I haven't beaten the gym leader after more than 30 tries, I don't think this is ever going to happen in a real Nuzlocke run. But before giving up, I go back to the drawing board. For me, this means I go to the Pokemon database, or something like that, I look at my current roster to see if there are any moves that can help me out. Here, lo and behold, it says that Leopard can learn Rock Smash, which I could have sworn I had already tried. But it turns out, I tried on Perleon and not Leopard. I just didn't realize it. Perhaps you already realized this mistake and you were screaming at your screen for the last few minutes. But hey, I got there eventually. Sometimes it just takes a while to get smart. Anyway, we now have a small ray of hope. Or a ray of despair, since we're the dark side? Who knows? I start the game over one more time, being even more experienced, get another female Perleon, who is naughty, that sounded weird, but it means she gets an attack boost. With naughty Ventress, I barely managed to beat the first gym, but we do with two HP left. That was close. We handily beat N, and hopefully, for the last time, we face off against Lenora. My first Rock Smash lowers Herdier's defense as she misses a takedown, then falls to one more Rock Smash. That was a perfect first Pokemon. Against the Watchdog, I use Growl because I think she'll use Retaliate with double power, but she just uses Hypnosis, which I heal with a berry. And then I start smashing some rocks over Watchdog's head. It takes a few hits to get the defense drop, and Lenora does heal Watchdog, but now it's a two-hit KO, and it's all over. After many, many, Many attempts and countless hours, I finally have two gym badges. We're like one fourth of the way to the Elite Four. This is going super well. I've always despised Misty as a second gym leader, and that's because I used to choose Charmander, since he's obviously the best, but now Lenora might actually be my least favorite gym leader of all time. After our fight, Team Plasma tries to achieve their goal of Pokemon liberation by stealing a dead Pokemon skull. Not sure how that helps, but all right. I get the stupid skull back, because I have to do everything for the adults in this game, and make my way to the Sky Arrow Bridge. Again, I've never played this game before, so I was kind of taken aback by this area. I know the DS is old news now, and has been for a long time, but this whole transition, I don't know, I thought it was pretty cool. And imagine how much better it would have been had I played this when it came out 12 years ago. If you've enjoyed watching me struggle this much at the beginning of the game, first off, what's wrong with you? But secondly, be sure to subscribe so you can see more videos of me struggling and very occasionally actually succeeding in future videos. Walking around Castelia City is a similarly cool experience. I like the way the camera pans around and the alleys and everything. This game really does give off a futuristic feel, but without overdoing it like many other games do. 
As soon as I enter Castelia City, I go north to Route 204, where I catch a female Scraggy named Treya. Now Treya has Moxie, which is exactly what I wanted. It's much better than Shedskin, in my opinion. On my way back to the Poké Center, I cross through an alley, where I find two guys who are totally either dealing or using contraband, a woman who's just dancing for no apparent reason, and a man behind a trash can who straight up flashes me. Maybe I praised this city a little bit too early. I also get stopped by this lady who starts asking random questions under the guise of it being a simple questionnaire, but she's actually just trying to get my data, you know. The thing your cell phone does now on a daily basis? It was much harder back then though, and what a simple world it was. Good old 2012. I have a party with some of the gym leaders by the docks, and Bianca's there too, I guess, complaining about losing her Pokemon or some such nonsense. Man, this is a lame party. I find Team Plasma, ruin their plans yet again, walk through some honey, which is pretty gross by the way, and go to fight Burke. Trya leads against Whirlipede as I use Workup and avoid a Screech, which is nice. Feint Attack is now a two-hit KO, so after taking a weak Poison Tail, Whirlipede goes down. I get a Moxie boost and level up. The Leafany wastes a turn with Protect, and then hits a critical Razor Leaf that I survive, and knock it out with a payback that does double damage because I was just hurt. Against the Dweeble, I could probably take it out, after all I do have a 3 times boosted attack, but I don't want to risk losing Trya so early. So I bring out Ventress, who after a few turns, wins us the third badge. This one was much faster than the second one, at least. As I try to leave the cesspool town that is Castelia City, I get stopped by Bianca, who wants to have another indoor fight, because the last one turned out so well. But with my Moxie Trya, this is a really easy and quick fight. By the way, I'm not going to show her fights anymore unless something super interesting happens. Next, on Route 204, Sharon also accosts me, and he suffers the same fate as Bianca. I'm trying to get my third encounter here, guys. Please just leave me alone. After beating him, I get a Zoom call, but I'm really not paying attention. I need a Sand Dial. Just let me go get one already. Yeah, yeah, I'll meet you in Nimbasa City, fine. When they finally let me go, I get to the desert resort and catch a male sand dial. Finally, a boy, who I name Vader. This guy also has Moxie, which I'm coming to love. But Intimidate still would have been pretty good. We get to Nimbasa City, and I see Team Plasma picking on some old guy. Picking on helpless fetus Pokemon? Check. Messing with old geezers? Check. These guys are certainly going out of their way to make sure we know they're the bad guys. And they had such promise, too. I enter the musical hall and am forced to dress up Ventress. Somehow I don't think she likes this. As Bianca and I leave, her dad appears and wants to take her home. Which is understandable. She did already get her Pokemon stolen, right? He has a point. It's a dangerous world. But then a model with a pretty face shows up, says the same things Bianca has been saying the entire time, and all of a sudden her dad is cool with it? Okay. Before I can beat pretty face in the gym, N takes me on the most awkward Ferris wheel ride of my life, where he tells me his deepest, darkest secrets, and then he tries to beat me up once we reach the ground. I'm getting some mixed signals here, man. What's going on? To prepare for the upcoming gym battle, I spend a good long while stealing cherry berries from unsuspecting wild emolgas. The problem here is that they only appear in rustling grass, so it's a relatively slow process. But eventually, I get enough for all of my Pokemon, and I go to fight Pretty Face. Ventress starts with a fake out, because why not? Then, anticipating the Volt Switch, I use Pursuit, which does double damage and kills the Emolga. Nice. The second Emolga comes out, and since I would die to a crit, I bring out Vader, who's immune to Volt Switch. Vader gets Aerial Aced, and then hits a Rock Tomb to lower Emolga's speed, and knocks it out with an Assurance, getting the Moxie Boost. Zebestrika uses Flame Charge to get a speed boost, but goes down to a single dig. That didn't need to be crit for a one hit KO by the way. Ever since we beat the second gym, things have been going relatively smoothly. At this point, I go to the battle train so I can eventually earn enough points for the choice scarf, which I need, or rather, really want, for the next gym. Now obviously, my Pokemon do die here, but I for one, don't count these types of areas as deaths since it's not part of the story and they don't give me any experience. You can disagree with me, and that's fine. If there are a lot of people who disagree, I'll try to not do this type of thing again in the future. But I really wanted the Choice Scarf here, and there's no other way to get it. So let me know what you all think down in the comments below. But be nice about it, alright? My ego is already deflated after losing countless times to the normal gym. But after beating a baby on this train, my ego got a little bit of a boost. If a hero never loses, 
I guess he's not a hero. Sorry, that was me. I leave Nimbasa, and once again, Charon wants to fight. But I destroy his entire team using only Trya, so it's not that interesting of a fight. On the way out of this place, we meet the champion, Adler, who makes us beat up some kids to teach us about loving our Pokemon or something. They're literally preschoolers. What's up with this? After thoroughly trouncing a couple of toddlers, boosting up my ego yet again, we get to the Driftvale drawbridge that is only lowered because Pretty Face says so. What about all the other people who want to leave this city? They can't just walk on the bridge? I mean, the lowering of the bridge is pretty cool, I guess, but I have a vital question. How in the world did all of these people get onto the bridge that I literally just saw lowered? Were they just hanging on for dear life while it was raised? We may never know. These are the important questions Pokemon needs to answer. When I get to Driftvale, Gym Leader Clay blames me for letting Team Plasma escape because they got away when the bridge was lowered. I do a bunch of unimportant Team Plasma stuff, like walking in on a bunch of grown men huddled together in a shipping container, and Clay deems me worthy to challenge him. Gee, thanks. Which is his loss because Trya, with the Choice Scarf and a bit of EV speed training, outspeeds and one-shots every Pokemon on his team. And with that, we have five badges. As I try to leave Driftvale, Bianca wants to lose another Pokematch. So I oblige, and she gives me Fly. Which, there is a Flying Dark Pokemon, but I won't get it for a very, very long time. Too bad. In this pretty cool cave, I find N and these ninja people, get through it without too much trouble, and arrive at Mistleton City, where I get accosted by a man who is also a Professor Juniper, as if one of them weren't enough. He introduces me to the gym leader Skyla, who points out that this professor has been to Kanto and Sinnoh. Alright, maybe I was too harsh on him. At least he knows where the cool Pokemon are. I'm talking about Kanto, by the way, in case you didn't get that. Yeah, I'm joking, but at the same time, Kanto is my favorite region for nostalgia, if nothing else. Anyway, Skyla says she saw a sick Pokemon from way up in the sky and invites me to come along if I want. I don't want, actually. I very much don't want. But, to progress the story, I suck it up and go help a Pokemon. After exploring the city, that is. Isn't it a bit dangerous to have these greenhouses right at the edge of the runway? Skyla better be a really good pilot or they're gonna have to build a lot of these greenhouses. On my way to the sick Pokemon, I accidentally run into a trainer who wants to have a rotation battle, but I have no idea what that is. Have I mentioned I've never played this game before? Well, it's relevant here because I don't know what the heck I'm doing. I eventually figure out how it works, but Trya got a bit closer to death than I would have liked. Can you imagine losing a Pokemon here simply because I didn't know how to do a rotation battle? Well, I guess I did technically wipe to Lillipup already, so this wouldn't have been the worst part of the run. Even so, I do manage to win and then get a phone call from my mom, who once again tells me she's my mom, even though it's a Zoom call. I can see her face right here. It's almost as if she's trying to convince me of something. Wait a second. Am I adopted? I enter the Celestial Tower and climb five flights of stairs only for Skyla to inform me that the Pokemon has already left. Well, that's 30 minutes of my life I'm never getting back. And so, I decide to teach Skyla a lesson about wasting other people's time by beating her up. Because violence is always the answer. I give Vader the black glasses and with Moxie Boost, he should be strong enough to crunch all her Pokemon in a single hit. Or apparently not. Dang it. I'm really lucky she didn't use Bubble Beam here. After Skyla heals her Swanna, the next crunch does one shot. I guess I must have gotten a really low roll and didn't quite do the calculation correctly. Even though this fight didn't go as expected, it still goes to show you how great Moxie really is. Here I have another fight with Sharon, which is uneventful, with one exception. You see, I know that his Pig Knight has leftovers, so I take a little bit of a risk and use Thief on him. It's not until quite a bit later that I realize I don't have leftovers in my bag. I didn't know that it's in Gen 5 when Thief no longer works on trainer Pokemon. More accurately, you don't actually get to keep the items after battle. I was so proud of myself for stealing them too. I guess crime really doesn't pay. Unless you're in Gen 4 and below, then it still does. Before entering Twist Mountain, I have to fight a trainer with a girder, which sucks because he's a fighting type, but also because his sprite really creeps me out. Like look at that thing. Thankfully, I have Aerial Ace, so I take him out in just a few hits and don't have to look at it anymore. As I'm working my way through Twist Mountain, whose layout changes based on seasons, which reminds me a lot of the Oracle of Seasons, I encounter another Creeper Girder. Why must they taunt me so? In Icarus City, I find a woman who tells me how happy my Pokemon are, 
and that she's jealous of my relationship with Ventress. I don't really know what to do with that information, but there it is. I make my way through the ice puzzle, which is basically obligatory in all Pokemon games, and get to the gym leader, Bryson. And I apparently forgot to heal at the Poke Center because I only have three PP left for Brick Break. Thankfully, he only has three Pokemon. And Trya, with her Moxie boosts, takes out his entire team without missing a beat, winning us the seventh badge. Outside of the gym, my friends and I are having a calm conversation when Bryson rudely interrupts us. Turns out, he was talking to the secret ninjas who were somehow invisible. Okay, these guys are basically just messenger ninjas for N because N wants to talk to me at the Dragon Spiral Tower. And just like that, they are gone again. How long were they going to sit there without revealing themselves? Were they just eavesdropping on our conversation? I enter the tower to find Charon and Bryson both beat me there and are holding off some Team Plasma grunts. But not all of them, because some of them are still free to fight me. Which doesn't make a ton of sense to be honest. I mean N, the apparent king of all of Team Plasma, literally just invited me to talk at this tower, and he said nothing about needing to fight my way up to the top. Yet now we have all of his underlings undermining that invitation. At the top of the tower, we have a brief anime-like cutscene of N staring at a scary black dragon, who tells me he is now a hero and he wants me to be one too, and then flies off on his new trusty steed. I make my way through Relic Castle in the desert, where they drop some exposition about Adler's dead Pokemon. Sad stuff. I get given the light stone that Team Plasma conveniently ignored some time ago, and begin my own hero's journey. I cross another pretty cool bridge, and am immediately attacked by a wannabe baseball player. That was rude. After some time searching in the grass, I find and catch a female Pawniard, who I name Repa. This was the first encounter in such a long time. I get stuck in the Dragon Puzzle Gym for quite a while, but eventually figure it out and begin the last gym battle against Drayden, who's got a jaw-like thing going on, which is pretty appropriate for a Dragon Leader. And while dragons tend to be really strong, they've got nothing compared to Moxie boosted crunches from a newly evolved Vader. Moxie is just so freaking awesome. With that, we've won the eighth and final gym badge, the Legend Badge, which is actually a pretty cool name. Before I can get to the Elite Four though, I have to fight Sharon one last time. But again, Moxie is so awesome, this is a simple and quick fight. After that, I catch a female Vullaby, point named Talzin, and a male dino called Tyrannus. And for the first time in literally forever, I have a full team of six dark Pokemon. Just in time for the end of the game. I get through Victory Road and decide to do something drastic. You see, since I've never played these games before, I think I've mentioned that. I just assumed that Zora would be a late game Pokemon. Turns out he's an event Pokemon that you can't get in a normal run. But screw that, we're the bad guys, right? So I make this event happen and trick the guy into coming with me. And I name him Sidious because he's a master of disguise and subterfuge. With my very legitimately obtained Pokemon, we are ready for the Elite Four. In this gen, you can choose the order of the fights, so naturally, I go for the easy ones first, as I get abducted by ghosts. Fun! Chantal starts with Cofagregis as I send out Rava the Pawniard. I can't do a simple moxie sweep here because of the Coffin's mummy ability, which copies itself onto my Pokemon, so instead I start with a nasty plot, get hit with a shadow ball, revealing that I was Sidious all along. Who knew? With my boosted special attack, Sidious sweeps the whole team with an expert belted shadow ball. You might notice here that Talzin is gaining experience because she has experience share. That's because I'm trying to level her up just enough to get her to evolve before the fighting Elite Four member. For the next fight, I have to wake Caitlyn up from her nap so I can kick her butt. She shouldn't be sleeping on the job anyway. I start with Talzin for the experience and immediately pivot into Vader on a Thunder who responds with a one hit KO crunch. The Sigil Glyph also goes down to a crunch. Against the Musharna, I swap back into Talzin on a Shadow Ball, and again to Vader on a Charge Beam, who kills with a crunch. And it's the same story with Gothitel. Swap to Vullaby, right back to Vader on a Thunderbolt, who finishes off Caitlyn with one last crunch. Leveling up himself, as well as Talzin, who doesn't actually evolve. So, it turns out, I mix up the evolution levels of Vullaby and Pawniard. Vullaby evolves at 54, and Pawniard at 52. But in my mind, it was the other way around. And that kind of sucks, because now the Marshall fight 
with his fighting Pokemon is going to be a lot more difficult than I had already anticipated. First, we have another easy fight against Grimsley, where a Choice Scarf Trya with Brick Break sweeps his entire team. Man, Dark Pokemon can really destroy the first three members of the Elite Four in this game. No problem. Now we get to the fight I've been dreading, Marshall. Because I'm upset that Talzin didn't evolve, I decide to let her die first. But I do give her a fighting chance with Choice Scarf to outspeed the throw, and she immediately gets a crit for the knockout. Not bad. Against Sock, he survives a fly because of Sturdy and doesn't quite kill me with a Stone Edge. This gives me a free switch into Ventress on a heal, the Pokemon I'd be least upset to lose, after the Darwin defying Talzin that is. I use Fake Out to break the Sturdy, but Aerial Ace still misses out on the kill as Ventress almost dies to a Karate Chop. But since Marshall heals, I get two free Aerial Aces for the knockout. I can't believe I haven't lost anybody yet. But I'm sure that'll change with his Conklador. I can't risk a swap, so I decide to sacrifice Ventress to do some damage with Aerial Ace as his Hammer Thrust misses. Dang! Another Aerial Ace isn't going to kill, and Ventress and I have had some pretty good times, so let's kill Talzin instead. I swap her in on another Hammer Arm. That also misses. I can't believe my luck here. Talzin goes for Fly and kills the Conkledor. Wow. Marshall's last Pokemon is Mindchow, who I outspeed thanks to the Choice Scarf, and thanks to my Fly, he misses a Jump Kick, takes a ton of damage, and dies as Talzin comes back down to Earth. Holy crap. In reality, I didn't need either Talzin or Ventress for the next few fights, and I had already accounted them as being dead, but this worked out so much better than I ever could have hoped. I am glad they survived. After the last fight, Reva evolves because I gave the correct Pokemon the experience share now. It's kind of lame that it takes so long for both Ponyard and Vullaby to evolve, but it is what it is. With all Elite Four members defeated, I take the secret entrance to the champion's... uh... castle? This place is huge! Suckers like Steven and Cynthia only get a single room, but my boy Adler, he gets a whole Taj Mahal. That didn't help him beat Endo, but hold on one second. The whole time, while I was beating four Elite Four members, N was fighting Adler? Why did it take him four times longer than any of my fights when N has a freaking legendary dragon? That's weird. And we once again hear about Adler's dead Pokemon. I get it already, sad backstory, let's do this thing. N must have heard me because he raises his castle, which just so happens to be surrounding the champion's castle already. Apparently, he also heard me praising Adler's sick crib because N's is much bigger and blows Adler's out of the water. And for some reason, it shoots out like a million stairs. Isn't that a little overkill? This cutscene is a bit on the long side, but eventually it finishes and we're back to the game. After N is almost squashed by his own staircase, I mean. I head into the castle where I find Team Plasma Sages trying to preach at me, but I'm not buying it. Then all the gym leaders just pop out of nowhere to hold off these bad guys. It's cool that in this game, the gym leaders actually do things instead of just giving me a badge and then fading into obscurity. With the gym leaders here, I can escape the sages and immediately go the wrong direction. Man, I really don't want to walk by all those people again because that would be super awkward. Could I just stay on this side and let N win? No? Okay, walk of shame time. Just don't look at me, guys. A few floors up, I find N's old nursery, which is a pretty sweet room. At the top of the tower, I find N, whose black dragon is too cool for a Pokeball. Instead, he just busts through the wall like the Kool-Aid man. A white dragon comes in from somewhere, with a much lamer entrance, I admit, who I catch and put into the PC. I don't need you. And then, the final fight with N begins. There are only two moves that Zekrom can use against Vader, Light Screen and Giga Impact. Since I don't really know which one he'll use, I can't start with Protect. Instead, I go with a sub as he sets up a Light Screen. The next turn, I do a ton of damage with Bulldoze as he breaks my sub. I set up another one, and then take out the not-so-scary Black Dragon. The Ice Cream Cone goes down to a Brick Break, and the Cling Cling to a Bulldoze, which was actually the Zoroark. The Karakoster survives a Brick Break because of Sturdy, but I still have a sub up, so we're good. The Lame Squirtle gets healed, and then falls to two more Brick Breaks. The real Cling Cling comes out, and also falls to a Bulldoze. And last is the Archaeops, who might have been concerning, if I didn't just get 5 attack boosts from Moxie. So he goes down to a single crunch. And that was a super easy end fight. 
After my win, Gestis comes in and starts making fun of N, revealing that he's been a pawn this entire time. That was actually pretty obvious, man. Even I, who'd never played this game before, knew that was coming, so, you know, big surprise, I guess. Anyway, we still have one more fight. I can't swap my team around, but at least I do get healed. So against his Kafagrigus, I start with Vader, who immediately pivots to Reva on a Toxic. And this lets me swap into Trya without getting poisoned, who outspeeds and uses Substitute so he won't get Toxic at all. I go for a couple of workups and then hit him with a Smackdown, which doesn't do all that much. Smackdown here was the only physical TM move that I had that doesn't make contact, and I want to keep Moxie, so it's my only option. I do one more workup and then just start wailing on him. Now, I certainly could have just gone with six workups, but for the last battle of the run, I wanted to use Moxie at least a little bit. Next, out comes his Hydreigon, which is his scariest Pokemon. But I still have a sub, five attack boosts, and I have a wide lens. So high jump kick is all but guaranteed to kill him. He misses focus blast anyway, and then goes down. I didn't even need a sub, I guess. With my now six times boosted attack, I take out the Buffalant with a high jump kick, and the Electros, then the Seismitoad, and finally the Bisharp 2, winning me the last fight of the run. Now, I'm not a big fan of using Substitute and boosting my attack, generally speaking, but it was the only way I could see to get out of this without guaranteed losing anybody. And since I didn't lose anybody against Marshall, I couldn't lose anybody against this old guy because that would suck. After the fight, Adler and Sharon become cops and escort this old guy out of here. N and I have another heart to heart, and then he leaps out of the castle onto his trusty steed, never to be seen or heard from again. Except for Nova Part 2, I'm sure, which I've actually never played either. Before we end the game, I'm still a little bit bitter about this to be honest, but I do feel like Talzin earned the right to evolve, even if it is two levels too late to actually do anything. Still, she did a good job in the one major fight she actually contributed to, which is more than I can say about Reva at least, the freeloader that she was. Aside from the rough start I had, and the very real possibility of wiping to Marshall, this run actually went pretty well. Once I got some momentum, meaning that I got Pokemon with Moxie, my guys were unstoppable. And I've gotta say, I was instantly a big fan of the Unova region. It doesn't have the nostalgia for me that the older regions do, but it's certainly up there among my favorite Pokemon regions. And so, I'm excited to return to Unova in the sequel games. But first, we'll head back to Johto for another challenge run. I hope to see you there.